Good morning and welcome to the National Press Theatre. I'm Laura Payton. I'm moderating today. Uh, with us, we have the McDonald Laurier Institute with a new, uh, two new papers. To my right is Douglas Bland. Next to him, Brian Lee Crawley, and then uh, Ken Coates. Um, you have an opening statement, I imagine. And then if you would like a question, just signal me by raising your hand. Great. Go ahead. Thank you. In fact, uh, each of us will speak for uh, briefly. Uh, I'm Brian Lee Crowley. I'm the managing director of the McDonald Laurie Institute. Uh, those of you uh, familiar with the Institute will know that we're a national public policy think tank based here in Ottawa. Um, the purpose of uh, the release of these two papers today is to launch a brand new project that uh, we are undertaking at the Institute uh, called Aboriginal Canada and the Natural Resource Economy. The reason that we're undertaking this project is that we believe uh, several important things are coming together for Canada in a way that they never have before. On, the f on one hand, we have the tremendous opportunity that the natural resource economy offers to Canada, and indeed uh, not just to Canada as a whole, but to uh, various parts of Canada, uh, whether we're thinking about uh, uh, nickel deposits in uh, Newfoundland, or we're thinking about natural gas offshore of Nova Scotia, or we're thinking about the Ring of Fire in Ontario, or we're thinking about uh, the oil sands and other hydrocarbons uh, uh, on the prairies, thinking about copper, uh, forestry, and so on in British Columbia, in every part of the country, uh, we're seeing unprecedented opportunities arise as a result of the natural resource economy. So that's one. Number two is we think that we have in Canada arrived at a bit of a sweet spot in terms of the relationship between Aboriginal people and natural resource development as a result of constitutionalization of treaties and Aboriginal rights, as a result of judicial decisions, as a result of uh, political activism over the last 40 years or so. Aboriginal people have achieved an un unprecedented level of uh, importance, authority, uh, and power over natural resource development. Uh, and we think that um, that therefore presents Canada with two alternative futures. On the one hand, and th this is the reason we've done two papers today. On the one hand, if we uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians together can reach an understanding about how Aboriginal people will pr fully participate in the development uh, and the prosperity uh, generated by natural resources, uh, we think we will have unlocked a puzzle that has uh, confounded Canadians for uh, over a century. That's the paper that Ken Coates has written. I'm going to let Ken talk to that in a second. The alternative future, if we get it wrong, if we do not succeed in finding the way to allow Aboriginals and non-Aboriginals together to participate in the natural resource economy successfully, uh, I think we face the potential of a uh, great deal of uh, disruption, uh, of uh, demonstrations, uh, of unhappiness, of uh, uh, obstruction of development that I think will harm the interests of both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. Douglas Bland has written a, a, a terrific paper uh, which is going to talk about that uh, alternative, not because we think that's the likely outcome, but because it's important for us to know that we stand at a crossroads uh, in Canada uh, on these issues and that we have choices ahead of us. If we make the right choices, we think the future can be very bright for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Canadians. If we make the wrong choices, we think that uh, the future uh, could be very dark indeed. I'm going to turn things over to Ken to uh, speak for a minute about uh, his paper. Well, thank you, Brian, and, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, our paper is titled New Beginnings, and I think that describes what we think we have to do in Canada. We have to start over. Um, build on existing activity, build on a, a real accomplishments, but actually think a little bit differently about how we, how we go forward. The state of uh, the social economic conditions of Aboriginal people represent one of the greatest failings in, in Canada in, our, in our, our history. We have to do much better uh, than we have done to this point. But I think the starting point has to be a bit different than what you're used to hearing. First Nations people have made it absolutely clear they want to work within the structures of Canada, that they actually have confidence in our institutions, in Parliament, in our court system, in our legal system. Uh, they continue to refer to it in many different ways. 
Um, and they should, because if you look at the last 20 or 30 years, there has been a major increase in the Aboriginal political power related, related to resource rights. Um, you've seen and heard probably of the sort of long string of more than 100 court decisions that have reinforced the Aboriginal right to have a prominent pro role in resource development. Uh, most commonly, this is referred to as the duty to consult and accommodate that you cannot have development on Aboriginal land without working with the communities first, not just talking to them in a technical way, but actually working with them to make sure that resource development works in their benefit as much as others. Uh, we also have modern treaties all across Northern Canada uh, we have some very, very successful modern treaties that have been implemented that actually build in a spirit of partnership and collaboration right into the foundation of economic and resource development. Um, but you also need to recognize that for Aboriginal people, building, being part of a mine project or a pipeline project is not the end in itself. Um, not even the jobs are not the ends in themselves. What they're looking for is the chance to strengthen and preserve their cultures, their traditional values, their language, and their, uh, their way of life. And they see resource development as being an important part of this. So as Brian's pointed out, the resource opportunities in Canada are crystal clear. Uh, we've had a huge explosion in international interest in resource development. The resources are there in every part of the country. We have the technological capacity uh, to take them out. But the other part that's really often left off this sort of conversation is the fact that we actually have a lot of really good models, effective good practice in Canada now. Uh, the treaties in the north actually provide a foundation for Aboriginal participation in all aspects of resource development, the approval process, and even getting royalties out of the developments that occur. We have impact and benefit agreements between individual mines and projects. We have royalty revenue sharing in British Columbia, uh, where a percentage of the government's revenue that comes in from resource development actually is going directly back to the, uh, to the First Nations communities. We have one of the most under appreciated sort of new developments in, in recent Canadian economic history, and that's the development corporations, Aboriginal holding companies that have tens and in some instances hundreds of millions of dollars of assets accumulated partly through resource development and going down the line through additional resource activity. What First Nations Métis and in what people do not have is the assurance that the projects that they're going forward on um, actually are fair and just. This is their last chance, their only chance in many communities. If there's a, an isolated community, we'll probably only have one mine located near it. If it doesn't do a good project, if it doesn't get a good deal, then they've squandered the one opportunity they have, and they're not sure. So this project has actually been very heavily in, involved with, uh, with Aboriginal people. We've consulted with them uh, to this point. We have their support and encouragement uh, sort of going forward because they want a nonpartisan think tank to come up with policy recommendations and frameworks that actually show how Aboriginal resource development can work in the benefit of, the benefit of Aboriginal, Aboriginal communities. And I just want to end with one sort of final point and just to reinforce something I've already said. The goal of Aboriginal economic development is not the same as it is for many other communities many other parts of Canada. They see resource development as being a critical tool in actually providing strength in their communities, socioeconomic opportunity, and cultural survival. And because of that, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities are serious about getting proper, sustainable, appropriate deals on the resource development front, and we hope we can assist them in achieving exactly that goal. Thank you, Ken. I'm going to turn now to uh, Doug to talk about, uh, about his paper. Yes, morning. Um, the paper is called uh, uh, Cooperation or Conflict uh, Amongst Canadians and Aboriginal People. The background uh, to this paper is, as most of you will understand, there are many, many very angry, frustrated uh, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal leaders across country. They're, they have been protesting, they have been uh, gathering they have been um, building their capabilities to continue to protest. There is, of course, as we've, we've just heard, all sorts of wonderful opportunities for Canadians and Aboriginal people, not just in the natural resources field, but in, in uh, cooperation with each other as a community. However, the underlying tensions and mistrust that's in the Aboriginal community uh, is important must be recognized. What we have to do uh, as a society, what governments have to do is understand the, uh, the set of grievances, but more importantly, understand how um, civil conflicts develop, what their characteristics really are, and how you can mitigate them. The 
usual uh, tack on in Canadian conversations is to focus on grievances and um, and uh, past uh, difficulties, but new research, mostly conducted by uh, researchers at uh, Oxford University, suggests that uh, focusing on grievances really doesn't get you very far. In fact, it may inflame the situation you're working on. In their research of more than a thousand civil disturbances, insurgencies and rebellions across the world over th more than uh, 30 countries, they dismissed almost entirely the concept of motive and grievances as the focal point for solving these kinds of problems. In this place, what they do, what they have discovered is what we need to understand is the feasibility, the possibility uh, of uh, such a civil disturbance arising in a community. They set out five important characteristics that make an insurgency feasible in any country, mostly dealing with the fractionalization of the, uh, the country like Canada into two groups, Aboriginals, non-Aboriginals, the number of people under the age of 25 in a community, in the Aboriginal community in Canada, 50% of the people are under 25 years of age. That's the warrior cohort, people who can get into all sorts of mischief. They need to understand the vulnerability of a, an economy like ours in which the transportation of natural resources across uh, very difficult to defend terrain uh, sits there as an easy target for someone who wants to upset our economy. And finally, we need to understand what researchers call the security guarantee. How secure are we and our Aboriginal communities from hostile uh, activities of all sorts of people? And so this paper takes that framework, the Oxford framework, and applies it to our situation and talks about the feasibility of an uprising uh, in Canada, or at least some sort of major disruption. The paper then goes into uh, discussions of the circumstances of the Aboriginal community under those five headings of, of uh, fractionalization, the warrior cohort, the uh, resource, transportation vulnerability, the top, uh, the problem of, of uh, security, and then at the end of the paper, I make some recommendations how we can address these problems, not by addressing here and there grievances, residential schools and so on, but by addressing the feasibility factor. What we need to do as a, as a community or two communities, if you will, is to lessen the feasibility of such an uprising happening. And I point out a number of ways that uh, federal governments, provincial governments, uh, and Canadians generally can make such a situation uh, less feasible and therefore less likely to occur. Great. Thank you, Doug. I should mention um, Ken Coates uh, is the Canada Research Chair uh, in Regional Innovation, I think, whatever that means, uh, <laughs> at uh, the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. Uh, Doug Bland is Professor Emeritus of uh, Strategic Studies at, uh, at uh, Queen's University. Um, those are our opening comments, and uh, we'd be glad to take questions. Okay, I uh, so far have one person on my list, Peter O'Neill of Post Media. Okay, I'll start with uh, uh, Professor Bland. Uh, we already know that there, there have been lots of uh, sporadic incidents of violence, Justice and Lagoka. I assume you're suggesting something more when you talk about the catastrophic uprising. Near the end of your paper, you talk about the possibility of First Nations under one leader. How real, exactly what kind of picture are you painting? What is the worst case scenario? Do you actually believe that the First Nations could unite under one leader and, and engage in some sort of actual violent uprising? You no, know, that, uh, if, um, if uh, I were to suggest to the Aboriginal people what they could do to make uh, an, 